Good morning. morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us us rejoice rejoice and be glad in it. I want to say a special word of welcome to all of you who are joining us in person today, but also those of you who are joining us online. We're glad you're here and uh, uh, hope you'll keep coming back, uh, as they say in some of the rooms that I frequent uh, from time to time um, through the week. And uh, I want to call your attention to several announcements. First of all, uh, today at 5.30, we invite invite you to join the Emmanuel Band for a relaxed evening of prayer and music, games, and so forth in the assembly hall of the Meeting House. All are welcome to join us, and we encourage you to bring a friend along, too. Um, The music will be a mix of secular and sacred, and for my money, anything that James Taylor sings is kind of sacred. (laughs) So... uh, So looking forward to uh, being part of that and and singing along. Um, As you may have seen in Friday's e-presence, there will be a memorial service for Bob Schultz on Saturday, August 27th at 2 o'clock, followed by a reception in the meeting house hosted by our Congregational Care Committee. So I hope you'll come and be part of that um, celebration of Bob's life and express your condolences to Mimi and the death of Bob. Next Sunday, August 28th, we hope you'll be here for our 10 o'clock worship service to join us in welcoming our new director of music, Patrick Walker, on his first Sunday at Emmanuel. And following the worship service, join us in saying goodbye to Liz Pernicki. Our wonderful director of youth ministries on her last Sunday with us. Finally, who's, our children's who's preaching ministry. a totally wild, a totally delightful pre- preaching and, for the first right, time. And she is also <laughs> preaching. Yes, she's preaching. So come and uh, be part of that as well. Um, finally, our children's ministry committee invites you to bring your kids and their friends along for a family fun night and pizza party at the meeting house beginning at 4 o'clock next um, Sunday. 4 o'clock next Sunday for a pizza party and family fun night sponsored by the Children's Ministry Committee specifically for families with with young children. And then finally, um, beginning Sunday, September 11th at 1.30, I'll be leading a a new Zoom class where we will be exploring challenging scriptural texts and how to interpret them. Uh, You'll find information and a Zoom link um, in your Friday e-presence. And just to add, if you're not currently receiving the e-presence, please contact Russ at the manual office and we'll make sure that you're added to the mailing list. Are there any announcements that need to be made that I've failed to make? If not, then let us turn our hearts and minds to God in worship. Yeah. 
Jesus Christ be with you all. Also with you. We have just sung, Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let's call ourselves as well into worship. I recall when I was growing up that holy, holy, holy was on frequent rotation. And it's not such a far oral step, at least, from H O L Y to W H O L L Y. And it's also easy to look around the world and see it is fragmented and stained, and corrupted, and to see ourselves as that way too. We do, however, get glimpses of what it's like to be whole. We can look at the life of Jesus and at the lives of people who have been deeply touched by him. It is that vision of wholeness that is within us that we can sense as our true home. In the words of that wise Saint Frederick Buechner, who passed away on Monday, it is wholeness that is in part what St. Paul means by saying that the deepest undercurrent of all creation is the undercurrent that draws us toward what he calls mature humanhood to the measure of the fullness of Christ. So let us be drawn this morning in worship toward that vision of wholeness for ourselves and for the world. Let us worship God. Amen. I invite you all to stand as you are able in body or in spirit to join us for hymn number 415, Come Ye Sinners, verses 1 through 3. Please. 
join in praying the unison prayer of approaching confession. Praise be to you, O God, for the dawn of this new day. Praise be to you for justice and righteousness. Praise be to you for mercy, grace, and compassion. Praise be to you for faith and hope and love. Praise be to you for belly laughs and the cries of hearts that love enough to be broken. We acknowledge how and where our souls are sin sick, poor and needy, preoccupied with that which does not matter, or worse yet, is destructive, consumed with what is unhealthy and unhelpful, tied up in pride, anger, resentment, hypocrisy, and greed. You have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are in need of mercy and call to show mercy. That's us, Lord. Forgive us. Remind us again of your grace and send us out to practice compassion. Let us continue our prayers in silence. Amen. There's a wideness in God's mercy that transfigures you and me. That mercy not just meets us where we are, but seeks us out, finds us, and loves us. Yes, loves us too much to let us stay that way. Just as we can experience the showering of God's love, let us listen to the embodiment of that love in the symbolic waters of our own baptisms. Hear the sound of love poured out. O Lord, open our lips. Praise. praise the Lord. All right, is there a sound? There is now. All right. Well, guess what season it is? It's the most wonderful time of the year. It's back to school. <laughs> and I brought my backpack so I could be ready. So for me, I always need something to hold, so I really need my clipboard. 
Um, so I'm here this morning with a message for our young disciples. And if we have any young disciples, I would really love it if you'd come down and join me. Does anybody know if there are any? I don't see anybody in the balcony. No young disciples. Okay. So this summer, we've been showcasing songs and hymns that have special meaning to us. And I tried to find a school, uh, a song that was just right for back to school time. So uh, I know that uh, I'm a familiar face for many of you, but for those, and especially those who are <coughs> joining us online, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Miss Hunter, and I've been a member of Emmanuel here for many, many years, a long time. And one of my very first jobs ever, being a, a member, was teaching the preschool class. And of course, as Sally will know, that was a really long time ago. <laughs> Our kids were there together. It turned out to be so much fun. And that was the spark that uh, made me want to be a teacher. So I went back to school and I started my education program. And so for the last few years, many, many years, I've been teaching uh, kindergarten and first grade. So I really have a lot of experience going back to school, not just as a student, uh, but as a teacher. And I know many of you also. <coughs> have many years, uh, many experiences of going back to school, and especially if you have to go back for that master's degree, right? It's really hard. Um, so tomorrow is the very first day of school in Fairfax County Schools. Anybody have uh, family members starting school tomorrow? Okay, I see a couple. All right, so a lot of you are gonna really be missing out on the first day of school here tomorrow. For me, the first day of school means that I'm going to be learning a lot of new things. I ha as a teacher, I have new students I have to get to know. I have a new schedule I have to remember. And I'll have some maybe new lessons to teach. Or the other hard part is to have some old lessons to teach, but a new way. And that first day of the week is really, really busy. So that leads me to my song for today. It's a very short prayer for spiritual fuel to keep my energy going all day long. And it's called, Give Me Oil in My Lamp. <laughs> so the lamp I brought today to show our children. Whoops. So this is <coughs> a lamp. A lamp gives light. <coughs> and in Jesus' day... The fuel was oil, so the fuel for my lamp today is batteries. The fuel for our candle up here is the wax, and so a, a lamp with oil in it will also burn like a candle. It gives out a light, and if the fuel dies, if there's no more oil in the lamp, there's no more light, and there's no more shining out. And for me, that's what I need for back to school, is a lot of good fuel for burning bright all day long, all week long. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. So, um, I think, raise your hand, do you know this song? Give me oil. Okay. okay, you have to stand up. You have to be my child, you have to be my student, you have to stand up and help me. Um, <coughs> So, um, we'll just go slow the first time around. It's easy to catch on. And then we'll just sing it two more times after that and get a little faster and faster. Yeah. Oh, every, no, everybody stand up, if you are, as you are able. <laughs> and get your arms ready. You've got to have your arms ready to move because this song is all about burning bright. So, you have to be able to move. And it uh, goes like this. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning, burning, burning. Give me oil in my lamp, I pray, hallelujah. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning, burning, burning. Keep me burning till the break of day. 
sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King. One more time. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning, burning, burning. Give me oil in my lamp, I pray. Hallelujah, give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning, burning, burning. Keep me burning till the break of day. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King. Okay, up to speed. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning, burning, burning. Give me oil in my lamp, I pray. Hallelujah, give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning, burning, burning. Keep me burning till the break of day. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King. Amen. <laughs> Oops. How perfect light and illumination. Let us join in prayer for illumination. Light of the world, too great to comprehend and as close as our heartbeat, open us today. Shine your light through the cracks that open our hearts and minds, that broken we may made whole through the hearing of your word. Bless the preacher now in preaching and your word to our hearing. Amen. Today we continue our summer sermon series on joy, how we express it and experience it and where we can find it in the midst of troubling times by examining the connection between joy and the experience of wholeness or healing. In our passage for this morning, we encounter a woman who has been unable to stand up straight for 18 years. Pay careful attention to what Jesus does when she appears in the synagogue and how the leader of the synagogue reacts to the situation and then to how the crowd responds to Jesus' interaction with the leader of the synagogue and his dealing with the woman who had been bent over and was now able to stand up straight. Hear now God's word as it comes to us in the Gospel of Luke. Now, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then, there appeared a woman who had been crippled for 18 years, with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over, and said, woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away and give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, 
all his opponents were put to shame. And the entire crowd was rejoicing at all of the wonderful things that Jesus was doing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Well, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. And may the gospel be more to us than mere words. May your Holy Spirit produce in us strong conviction. Amen. There is a moment in David Kamali's recent novel, Poemless Nights, in which the author's soul, portrayed as an ex-lover whom he meets some years later, speaks life-altering words to him. In just a tiny little snippet, he relates what she said and how he responded. I'm not looking for perfection anymore. I prefer wholeness, she said. Her words calmed my heart and made beauty of this whole mess. I'm not looking for perfection anymore. I prefer wholeness. What if that were the key to knowing joy? Not looking for perfection, but preferring and working towards wholeness, a wholeness that acknowledges flaws and imperfections in oneself and others and in the messiness of life in a world like ours. What if the key to knowing joy is to know and perceive that at the heart of the living divine there is a wholeness, a unity, that is able to take what is and somehow make beauty of it? Like most things that matter in life, looking for and working towards wholeness rather than perfection is easier said and done. Or said than done, of course. Take it from a recovering perfectionist. Let's look at Luke's gospel and what it might have to say about that. Jesus is teaching in the synagogue, and it's a Sabbath day. Luke doesn't tell us what Jesus is teaching, but... Given the sorts of things that Jesus says elsewhere in Luke's narrative, it probably, spoiler alert, has to do with love. The one who began his ministry by saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor and recovery of sight to the blind and release to the captives and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That one who proclaimed those things is probably going to be talking about love. With how, with how God cares about those who are regarded by society as the least, the last, and the lost, the ones who don't look the part, the ones who are so often on the outside looking in. And just then, a woman appears. She's bent over and quite unable stand up straight. Afflicted, Luke says, by a spirit that has crippled her for 18 years. On a purely physical level, there are lots of reasons people can become bent over and quite unable to stand up straight. A deteriorating disc in the back, rheumatoid arthritis, issues with joints in the hips and the knees, atrophied muscles. There are all sorts of reasons why people can wind up bent over and unable to stand up straight. We needn't introduce evil spirits into the equation to explain the issue. The fact that Luke, who is a physician by trade, by the way, suggests that a spirit has something to do with it, may have more to say about his rudimentary understanding of human physiology and psychology than about the true root cause. That said, there are three additional things worth noting here. Number one, regardless of what caused her condition, the bent over woman has the sort of physical infirmity that would have caused people both now and then to avert their eyes, 
to look down or away rather than right at the human being in front of them. It's our all too human tendency to look away from such brokenness, imperfection, and need, perhaps because it reminds us of our own vulnerability, that we ourselves could and maybe one day will be in that exact same position. Number two, the body, the mind, and the soul are inextricably interrelated. Spiritual and mental and emotional factors can and sometimes do play a role in the development of physical conditions. You know this to be true. I don't have to convince you of it. Number three, there are all sorts of ways beyond the physical that human beings can find themselves bent over and unable to stand up straight. We can be burdened with the pressure of unreasonable expectations or with the sense that we can never achieve enough to be loved. We can carry grudges and resentments that cripple our souls. We can be weighed down by external voices that keep us from standing up for ourselves or for what we believe in. The bent over woman who appears in the synagogue could serve as a physical representation of all of the ways that we and others might be hampered from being whole and standing up straight. Glennon Doyle's fairly recent book, Untamed, is all about the ways people, and specifically women, are hampered from being whole including people-pleasing and pursuing some sort of unattainable perfection. After naming much of the messiness in life, about how it's brutal and beautiful and all too often broken, Glennon writes, if this is our shared human experience, where did we get the idea that there is some other, better, more perfect, unbroken way to be human? Where is the human being who is functioning correctly against whom we are all judging our performances. Who is she? Where is she? What is her life if not these things that we too share? Have you noticed that one of the things that people often say when they hear or read something that names their experience is, I feel seen? I think that's a response that Glennon Doyle probably gets fairly often. Speaking of being seen, that's what happens with the bent over woman in today's text. Jesus sees her. God only knows how many people spent their lives trying not to see her or judging her by her infirmity rather than viewing her as a whole person worthy of being loved and noticed. And Jesus sees her. It's amazing what can happen when people feel seen, even just a little bit. On Friday, when I stopped for coffee at the 7-Eleven on my way home from my early morning workout, I, I saw Tony out front. I've talked about him before. He's there every so often, sitting on the ground until someone tells him to move along to the next place. And perhaps because of a sermon I preached long ago, I, I always make it a point to address him. I call him by name. Hi, Tony. And I remind him of mine. And I give him some money because I know I can and I know he could probably use it. And every time I call him by name, Tony lights up like a Christmas tree. And we exchange blessings. God bless you, he says. God bless you, I say. Seeing Tony is a tiny thing, and there's nothing heroic about it. It, it ought to be commonplace. But so many people don't see Tony. 
I believe I've taken the time to see Tony because of all the scripture texts that I've read, including stories Jesus tells in Luke's gospel about the Good Samaritan and and the rich man and Lazarus, by the way, the rich man who steps over Lazarus day after day after day, not noticing him. Tony's not a model of perfection. He's not the example of the guy who has it made. I don't necessarily aspire to be just like Tony. What he is is a fellow human being. To the extent my soul isn't looking for perfection, but instead for wholeness, I will see and get to know more Tonys. And by the way, I'll see and acknowledge more and more of myself and my own brokenness, my own character defects and imperfections, my own unhelpful tendencies, or to put it in good Presbyterian terms, Liz, my own sin. (laughs) It's seeing and acknowledging those things that can help make me whole. Pretending like those shadow sides of me are not there, acting as if to use the framework of the old westerns that, that... I and my group always wear the white hats, and those people over there always wear the black hats. That's what will guarantee that I'll never live a life of integrity or integration. Carl Jung was on point when he wrote, wholeness is not achieved by cutting off a portion of one's being, but by integration of the contraries. That's true in individual lives, and it's true in communities, and it's true in countries, and it's true in the world. The more we seek to cut people off, to regard them as less or other than, rather than being able to see them in their totality as a mixture like us of what we might consider the positive and the negative, the less likely we are to find joy and a way forward in this world. Which, by the way is a good reason to turn off any media that depicts people with whom you disagree as anything less than human or as anything less than people who love this country. It's also a good reason not to ban books or to carefully curate the history we teach so that we ignore the more unfortunate aspects of it. We need to look at ourselves and others in their totality. The good parts, the bad parts, the whole mixture. Some of you know that I love to wear different theme socks, and often on Sundays, I will wear one or the other now of these two pairs of socks. The one I have on now says, it's got an apple, and it says, a reasonably good guy. I think I'm a reasonably good guy. (laughs) Flaws and all, I'm a reasonably good guy. And the other pair of socks that I often wear lately is a pair that I found in New Orleans, and it says, imperfectionist. (laughs) I love that. I am a reasonably good guy who is an imperfectionist. What if I began to regard others as people who, for the, most, for the most part, really are trying their best with the tools they have? That might be a way forward in this broken world of ours. But you're not likely to hear that from a lot of the media that you consume, whether it's on the right or the left. But back to the woman who was bent over. Jesus sees her, and she's made whole, able to stand up straight again. You might think that the reaction of the synagogue leader would be joy. Wow, wonderful. And to think that this happened on a Saturday when everybody was gathered for worship. What a great thing to have happened. But that's not the reaction of the synagogue leader. Instead, irate, he berates the crowd. These are 
There are six days, he says, that, that you can come for healing. Come on those days. Don't come on this day. This is, this is the Saturday. This is the Sabbath. Don't come on this day. One of my favorite rabbis, aside from Jesus, and Amy Schwartzman is David Wolpe out in Los Angeles. And, and he started a service recently by saying, I love the sound of children making noise in the synagogue. I miss that sound. And then after he said that, he said, now it really is okay for you to be quiet. <laughs> but what if the reaction of the synagogue leader, of the religious leader, is joy at healing and wholeness and a, a child being able to stand up straight or a woman being healed? But that's not the man's reaction. Why? Why? I wonder if he's a little jealous that Jesus can do that and he can't. I wonder if he's threatened by the power of this particular rabbi. I don't know. But Jesus' response to him is, you hypocrites. If your ox or your donkey fell into a pit on the Sabbath, wouldn't you pull it out? And what about this woman who's been delivered from her brokenness? Why are we not rejoicing? The man is caught up in the rules and he's caught up in the judgments and he's caught up in making sure that he somehow is keeping order and, and making things just right. He's not a recovering perfectionist yet. And the story ends with people rejoicing because Jesus has put this man in his place. And that's not a satisfying ending for me. It's the kind of ending that I might hear consuming one or the other brands of media. Finally, we put that guy in his place, or finally, we put that person in her place. The more satisfying ending might be the ending that I imagine in the story that Jesus tells in Luke 15. You remember that story. People know this story. If they know very few other stories in the Bible, they know the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son goes away. He spends his inheritance. He comes back. The father runs out to greet him, says, great, you know, prepare the fatted calf. We've got to have a big party for him. And the older brother, the one who's been on the farm the whole time, taking care of things, is standing outside of the party with his arms crossed, saying, why does this guy get to have a party? And I've never even had a young goat killed for me. What I like to imagine is that at some point, that older brother decides it's time to come in and join the festivities. And I like to imagine that he has a little bit of the fatted calf. And maybe he gets out on the dance floor. And maybe his dad gets him a pair of socks <laughs> to wear with his sandals. And the socks say, on one side, a reasonably good guy, and on the other, an perfectionist. And there is a wholeness that has never been there before. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. <clears throat> From a broken sky, traced out by the city lights. My world from a mile high, best seat in the house tonight. Touch down on the cold black tide, hold on for the sudden stop. Breathe in the familiar shock, confusion and chaos. Are those people going somewhere? Why have I never cared? Give me your eyes for just one second. Give me your eyes so I can see everything that I've been missing. Give me your love for humanity. Give me your arms for the broken heart. The ones that are far beyond my reach. Give me your heart for the ones forgotten. Give me your eyes so I can see. There's a man just to a right, black suit and a bright red tie. Too ashamed to tell his wife he's out of work, he's buying time. All those people going somewhere, why have I never cared? Give me your eyes for just one second, give me your eyes so I can see. Everything that I keep missing Give me your love for humanity Give me your arms for the broken heart The ones that are far beyond my reach Give me your heart for the ones we got Give me your eyes so I can see Couple of million eyes just moving past me by. I swear I never thought that I was wrong. Well, I want a second glance, so give me a second chance to see the way you see the people all along. Give me your eyes for just one second. Give me your eyes so I can see everything that I can. Give me your love for humanity. Give me your arms for the broken hearted. The ones that are far beyond my reach. Give me your heart for the ones that got Give me your eyes so I can see. Yeah.
At this time, notice that we are not passing the offering plates, but invite you to make any offering you would like to make in the wooden box in the usher's corner or in the locked mailbox in the upper lot or one of <coughs> many of several other options that are available, including using the QR code, code to the right and so for secure giving. Thank you. Oh, mm -hmm. 
Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And, and forget, forget not all God's benefits. You may be seated. Let us pray. We thank you, generous God, for the gift of your presence, of your love embodied in Christ Jesus. We thank you for the way your love can transfigure us, take our bent and twisted <coughs> selves, and raise us up to look outward as well as inward, to rejoice in our new wholeness and reflect that in outward to all we encounter, empowering us to love and serve. Accept now our offerings of ourselves, our energy, our material gifts. We thank you for the love we have encountered this week, the love we have shared, the delight we have celebrated. We grieve for ourselves and for others. Our wounded world cries out. Help us to respond to both of these with the whole heart you are creating in us. As you see us through the wholeness of your vision for the world, help us see that wholeness in ourselves and in others. In joy, we beseech you. Amen.
As we leave this place, may God's healing and wholeness abide with each and every one of us and help us to see others in the light of their wholeness and our unity one with another. And now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God, our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer be and abide with each and every one of us today and every day forevermore. Amen. You may be seated as we move now to sharing our celebrations and concerns. Are there celebrations and concerns to be lifted up? Yeah, Diane. Um, I, again, uh, want to celebrate that tonight If not, then let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.